Again, thank you, Dr. Farrow, for hosting that last panel. It was a privilege to be a part of it uh, for certain. Let me offer my panelists uh, all queued up in the wings. Uh, this is we're going to heel to toe all the way through. So if I have Vice Admiral Dan Abel, um, you know, Rear Admiral Tom Rohde, and uh, Senior Executive Service Member Leanne Borman. Come on down. Good to see you, sir. This panel, of course, uh, as John Hyde articulated, this is about essentially Arctic security from uh, the various United States services that are involved in the Arctic region. Now, it's interesting to note here for those folks who don't, uh, especially in the community science, that don't necessarily distinguish between the different departments which these military services are part of, but it's important for the following distinctions. Uh, we have Vice Admiral Dan Abel, who's coming to us as the Deputy Commandant for Operations of the United States Coast Guard. In this case, the Coast Guard, of course, is a member of the a component within the Department of Homeland Security. And for those folks who really care about congressional preparations and congressional titles, Admiral Abel uh, conducts operation. In fact, his new call sign is, since he's been in the job, I've known Admiral Abel for quite some time, his call sign ops, because that's what he does for the United States Coast Guard. So not only does he uh, oversee the organized training and preparation of forces to conduct operation, but then he actually conducts those operations on behalf of assigned missions that come to the Coast Guard from the Department of Homeland Security, the senior department. He exercises Title 10 authorities as well as Title 14. Title 10 is that in business of defense. If you will, he supports the defense of the United States on missions assigned statutory to the United States Coast Guard. But he also conducts law enforcement operations uh, under Title 14. So in, in sum, uh, Admiral Abel and the United States Coast Guard, the operations that he shepherds for the nation across the planet is focused on from the hand of help, uh, if you will, to the clenched fists of resolve and everything in between. Uh, of course, Admiral Abel comes to us as each of these bios are located in your pamphlet, but he has extensive Arctic experience and uh, he's just come up from uh, Miami, the United States Southern Command. Before that, he was the Arctic operator uh, serving as the District 17 commander. For those folks to do note, we had planned to have Lieutenant General uh, uh, Tom Boussier with us, uh, but unbelievably, for an Air Force three star, we would expect to he'd be able to have an op his own airplane at his disposal, but he actually flies commercial, and uh, Alaska Airlines unfortunately canceled his flight. He would, uh, if he kept on schedule, would arrive here about five this evening, a little bit late for this panel, so he does send his regrets, and for those folks who saw the panel, he's not able to join us. Uh, from the United States Navy, representing the line views of the United States Navy from the N3, N5, if you will, the N3, N5 is the business of both operations and strategy and planning. And this is Rear Admiral Tom Rota, uh, who serves in the reserve capacity there, but being reservist doesn't mean anything less. He is a full-time, on-contact member of the United States Navy staff and making sure that not only operations but planning and strategy synchronize. And then from the United States Air Force, we have Leanne Borman, who comes from the A5. For those folks who know that's his planning and strategy for the headquarters of the United States Air Force. So from our vantage point, we got, if you will, these three pros from Dover from the respective vantage points. I also recommend the fact that each of these services that are represented here on the Coast Guard, we've covered both the Title 10 and Title 14. The United States uh, Air Force, the United States Navy operates, if you will, a service perspective that is essentially to organize, train, and equip forces for unified command. But in, in all sincerity, each of these services has their own Arctic strategy or Arctic strategy outlooks. It essentially, it tends to guide how those services present forces and conduct operations in support of the U.S. national interest in the Arctic region. So we, we plan this panel to give each of these panelists an opportunity to cover down on their perspectives from a service view in an open presentation. And then from that, we'll go to some Q&A, but we're going to do a kind of fireside chat style as best we can. So first of all, I'd like to go, we're going to go in ascending order, if you will, in this case here, we're going to start with Ms. Borman, who's coming up to cover down on the United States Air Force's advantages she sees from the Air Force in Arctic strategy and Arctic security. Leanne, I give you the floor. And I have the clicker if you want me to be the clicker person for you, as you wish. Well, I just want to make sure the microphone is working. You're loud and clear, <laughs> madam. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting the Air Force to participate in a forum called Naval and Maritime Operations. I know it might seem a bit odd, but uh, the Air Force has actually been 
a dominant and predominant DOD presence in the Arctic for decades, um, whether it was from air power's help in defeating the Japanese invasions of the Aleutian Islands during World War II, or our role decades li later, frankly, in developing radars to detect Soviet bombers coming across the poles during the Cold War. Uh, the imperative for the Air Force to be in the Arctic hasn't changed. Challenges to land and surface operations combined with vast area of limited infrastructure has meant that Air Force air power and capabilities have continued to be essential in the region, not only to gain access, but to provide long-term reach as well as timely response. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to hold on this slide for just a moment because there are a few things I wanna cover before we get into it because I know the tendency is to look at the slide. So um, one of the interesting things you'll see in today's Air Force mission is that the Arctic uh, is an area where we have almost 80% of the DOD Arctic resourcing. Our forces in the region are varied, uh, are, as are our mission sets. We host not only tankers, uh, fighters, helicopters, radars, but also space situational awareness assets, which are critical for homeland defense. Uh, the Air Force in the future is looking toward the security landscape, and we see that shifting, and I think those of you who've read the National Defense Strategy will see that the Department of Defense has shifted uh, looking at long-term competition. But we see the Arctic as a strategic ac asset, and we continue to see this as an area of opportunity. It's imperative for the Air Force to defend and protect international norms of access and navigation, and it continues to be in the best interest of the United States to maintain a region uh, that has stability, common norms of governance, and just, frankly, freedom of navigation. And slide, please. So the Air Force has four key tenants that it focuses on. The first being domain vigilance, which is the Air Force's ability to protect the homeland, which is rooted in our ability to achieve sufficient awareness of what's going on. Whether you're looking at missile defense and ISR architecture, having sufficient information is imperative for the Air Force. And we are partnering with both uh, the Joint Force but also Arctic partners to improve our communications and capabilities in the North. Next is our ability for power projection. Protecting America's interests in the homeland and abroad require the ability to protect power. This isn't something that's purely reserved for the Air Force. Of course, our other services have this imperative as well. But our service has been grow growing in regional posture to include F-22s, F-16s, bed down of future F-35s. And frankly, by the time we hit 2022, Alaska will have more advanced fighters than any other location in the world. We also provide the ability to reach places in the north, unlike others. The reality is we have refueling tankers capable and ski-equipped LC-130s that can land on ice, and that's a very limited capability. Next, and our third uh, tenant, is leveraging partnerships. The Air Force has been working with Arctic nations and partnering for decades. It's imperative for alliances and partnerships to continue not just with one nation work, but to ensure we have sufficient infrastructure and capability because we can, no one can operate alone in this area. Arctic partners hold immense experience that also helps the Air Force absorb lessons learned and improve our operations in contested environments in the future. And lastly, the Air Force is focused on preparation. It's of no surprise to this audience or anyone who's paid any attention to the Arctic environment that that level of austerity requires specialized training acclimation not only by materiel but also by the personnel. First organized in the 1940s, the Air Force has an Arctic survival program that is one of the oldest survival programs in the Air Force. And our search and rescue units work daily with the Coast Guard and other federal forces to ensure we're prepared for, to support and respond to incidents large and small. Uh, in conclusion, and before I pass it to my uh, counterparts, uh, I would note that the Arctic is often seen in terms of its liability, and we actually see it as a strategic asset. The Air Force is looking at the evolving security environment, and in this region, the Air Force will continue to play a critical role, and we look forward to working with our partners in the audience, as well as our other service partners into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to move to my good friend, Rare Motam Murata, for your reflection, sir. Thank you, and, and thank you for inviting the Navy to be here today. Um, the Arctic is an ocean, and the Navy spends a lot of time on the oceans. So uh, next slide, please. So before I get into our strategic objectives, I will tell you that for those of you who've been here both days, Dr. Richter Mengi talked about ISEX, Admiral Ray talked about the polar security cutter, 
and Navy Coast Guard cooperation and, and Coast Guard being a surface presence in the Arctic. And then uh, Senator Sullivan this morning told you exactly what the Navy's going to be doing in the Arctic, so I'm done at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, our number one objective in the U.S. Navy is to protect the nation. We are a maritime nation, and we are in the Arctic. We have been in the Arctic, and we will continue to be in the Arctic. Going all the way back to uh, Admiral Perry and uh, the USS Nautilus, as soon as we had nuclear-capable submarines, we've been operating under the ice in the Arctic. Uh, you may not know this, but a few weeks ago, the USS Pittsburgh trans transited from the Atlantic to the Pacific under the ice. So we are there. Um, we we want to make sure that everybody knows that when the military operates, we, ha we have the Navy, we have the Air Force. Navy, I'm also representing the Marine Corps as the Department of the Navy, and the Army. We op operate as a joint force. So we couldn't do what we do without the Air Force and the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard can't operate without the Air Force and the Navy. The Army can't operate without all of the services in support. So just so you know, if the, we're all a joint force, and that's how we have to decide, decide what we're going to do with our limited resources as we move forward in the defense budget. So I just want everybody to know, I'm talking about the Navy, but I can't do my mission without the Air Force, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, and Army. And the same is true for all of the services. So think in terms of joint, of joint force. So uh, look at, you can see the objectives there. Ensure the United States Arctic sovereignty and provide homeland defense, right? That, that seems like common sense. Provide ready forces to respond to crises and contingencies. We have, we have, I'll show you a slide, the last slide will show you where the Navy operates on any given day, and you'll see that it's a global Navy, and the Arctic is one of our strategic regions, okay? But, but it's not all of them. And then preserve freedom of the seas. What does that mean? Well, according to uh, international law, you are supposed to be able to transit commercially, militarily, privately through our oceans and through our straits. And so the United States Navy does not ask permission. We don't tell anybody. We just go where we can in accordance with international law. And so that's where you guys, you've heard today, uh, yesterday and today a little bit from our Canadian partners have, have mentioned that, and we'll talk about the Russians here in a minute. But that's how the Navy operates. We, we do that so that we maintain freedom of the seas. Uh, and by doing that as the US Navy, that ensures freedom of the seas for all nations, not just for the United States. So I just want to let you know the concept behind how the Navy operates in those cases. Next slide, please, Church. So here's some key elements of our strategy. The great power competition is real. We've mentioned it a couple times over the two days. Um, we, we call the uh, Arctic an area of low conflict, but it's not no conflict. If the Russians didn't, in March, send out a requirement that you needed to notify them 45 days in advance, put one of their pilots on your ship and give them the exact route that you're taking, there would probably be no conflict in the Arctic. But that is a conflict because that's restricting the freedom of the seas, freedom of navigation. With the, between the US and Canada, we've been negotiating that o over decades, but that's a, a State Department ongoing negotiation. But there's never been a requirement or a threat from the Canadian government to arrest your captain or sink your ship. So that's why the conflict is in the Arctic. It's not no conflict, it's low conflict. So uh, we need to look at it and we need to be honest. And if, if all nations in the Arctic Main, including the near Arctic nations that want to come up and operate in the Arctic, if they all follow the rule of law, then everybody gets along and this can be exploited, uh, not exploited, but it can be developed for the, the benefit of all nations. So the resources can be managed responsibly. The navigation for the commercial purposes of transiting through the Arctic can be managed responsibly. And as our Chinese colleague said, humankind can benefit from this but everybody has to follow the rules. That's why the military is there, the Coast Guard, the Navy, and the Air Force, and the Army. We are there to make sure that other nations follow the rule of law, okay? That's our goal, so that everybody benefits. Next slide, please. So,
So this is where the U.S. Navy operates on a daily basis. We are all over the globe from the Middle East to uh, the African continent to Northern Europe to the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. You'll see uh, up there to the north by the high north, uh, the USS Harry Truman and her strike group operated up there last year uh, for several weeks north of the Arctic Circle. I operated north of the Arctic, or in the Bering Sea uh, 30 years ago off the USS Constellation. So the US Navy is there, we're operating, we will continue to operate as we do around the globe. Um, as I said, the Pittsburgh recently transited under the ice, so you have a Navy presence in the Arctic now, and we want to make sure that people understand uh, the difficulties of operating surface combatants in the Arctic, but as, as we are moving forward, um, we don't want to talk about future operations or what we're going to do, so uh, just let it be known that our Coast Guard partners are there today on the surface and we are there under the surface, and our Air Force partners are there in the air. And the Army, as the Senator mentioned before, is there in Alaska ready to respond to any contingencies. So your joint force is in the Arctic and is ready to operate and respond to any contingencies. Thank you. And the last slide. I just wanted to show this so that everybody's on the same page as far as what the U.S. government defines as the Arctic. So if we operate in there, we're operating in the Arctic, and that does include uh, down through the Aleutians there. And you'll see uh, quite a robust presence in the Bering Sea and down through the Aleutians as we operate in there. And those, those uh, areas are very difficult to operate. The seas are high, the visibility is usually low, but the U.S. Navy can operate in there. The U.S. Air Force operates in there. And uh, the Coast Guard is always in there. So we operate together in some pretty harsh environments. And one of the big things that we are on ongoing and ISEX we talked about is we do a lot of research to learn how to operate. We talked about a low conflict area as the ice recedes and it becomes more commercially viable there and more people come then your military will also come in the future as, as necessary to defend those areas and make sure that everybody benefits and that everybody follows the rule of law. That's your Navy today. It's all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Admiral Abel, sir, you got the floor. And yep. we'll get our slides queued up here. Slide yeah, next, person, do your magic. Yep, next slide, please. I have killed the computer. Nope, you're good now, sir. All right, so I'm gonna start with a sea story because I'm an aviator. Tom, you missed out giving sea stories. So uh, when I got to um, Juno in 2012, I said, tell me about SAR in the Arctic. He said, we don't do SAR in the Arctic. Okay, good. And then we got a call from a spouse whose husband was making the trip from Canada to Canada, from Vancouver all the way across the top over to Halifax in a 47-foot custom-built sailboat. And the individual had a text device and was bouncing off a satellite to the spouse saying, there's a little more ice than I anticipated. So we asked the spouse to ask the member on the boat via text, are you declaring an emergency? No, I'm fine. A little more ice than I anticipated. <laughs> so at this point, we were a little concerned. We communicated, again, through the spouse, through the text device, that if the Coast Guard were to respond to your emergency, it would take 48 hours to get helicopters and crews to the North Slope to even begin a rescue. Are you declaring an emergency? No, I'm fine. I said, okay, call us every day and let us know you're fine. Okay, got that. So the next day, the spouse called and said, husband communicated the, the patch of water his boat is in is about the size of an Olympic-sized swimming pool, 47-foot boat. Is your husband declaring an emergency? No, he's fine. Okay. Next day, how's your husband doing? Polar bears are coming up to the side of the boat. <laughs> no kidding. We're beating pots and pans. I am beating pots and pans together to keep the polar bears from coming on my boat. And we said, are you declaring an emergency? No, I'm good. At this point, we decided he is declaring an emergency. We're just going to do it on our time schedule. So we contacted Coast Guard Cutter Healy, uh, which was only 200 miles away, which for the Arctic is the blink of an eye. And we said, number one, can you safely close the target without sinking him? Because the last thing we wanted was he really was fine. 
and a large chunk of ice came off the bow of the big iron ship and sunk him. He said, uh, we'll get as close as we can, we'll let you know. So they closed the target. That's a picture of the boat right there. Uh, they broke him out, brought him all the way into the north slope. They inspected his vessel, said, you're seaworthy, but you ought to wait for the ice to melt. And uh, he waited for the ice to melt a little bit. We said goodbye as he went into Canada, and we called him, I called my Canadian peer and said, he's all yours, and off he went. <laughs> So that is what we're seeing in the Arctic, is a changing habit of human activity and human behavior. And halfway through my time up in Juneau in 2013, the Coast Guard put out an Arctic strategy. And we just reissued a different strategy this summer. Now, doctrinal wonks will tell you, you don't put out a strategy that quickly. Two things must have happened. One, you got your strategy wrong. Don't think so. Partnerships, awareness, and governance were the right answers in 2013. The other answer would be, have conditions changed that then change what's in your plan? And absolutely, that's the case. The conditions had changed. In the six years since the Coast Guard had issued its strategic, uh, uh, its Arctic strategy, six Chinese expeditions had come through. Six more Russian uh, icebreakers were finished. Six Arctic bases had been finished by the Russians. 10 million tons moved in one year, 40% of that going to China or from China through the Bering Strait. 1,700 passengers were on one cruise liner, the Crystal Serenity. So things had changed. It was time for an update to our strategy. The Coast Guard had been there since 1867 when we raised the American flag on the territory. We're there to make sure that there's US sovereignty. But there is a lure now when you're talking 90 billion barrels of oil, 30% of the world's undiscovered natural gas, a trillion dollars worth of minerals, and of course a shortcut between Asia and Europe. So the first element of the updated Coast Guard strategy is to enhance capability in America's Arctic. It's interesting, folks ask, is the Coast Guard choosing to operate in the Arctic? Absolutely, because it's part of the United States. These are American citizens. We don't ask if we're gonna operate off of LA, Baltimore, or San Francisco. It's the American coast, and that's where the Coast Guard belongs. But we need to be there. Up to now, the presence has been seasonal and adaptive. When Shell was drilling, we hovered around there. When the activity moved further to the east, we moved there. But we have got to have the ability to exist and, uh, and be there seven by 24 year round. That's why I'm sure you heard Admiral Ray talk about the awarding of the contract for the Polar Security Cutter, uh, a huge breakthrough for the Coast Guard. Uh, we're looking to get at least six icebreakers. Three of them have got to be heavy icebreakers, and we need one right now. Our lone icebreaker that has to wait until 2023 for that relief to show up is the Polar Star. And the Polar Star is 40 years old. And although she's an all-star, she goes into pretty big rehab every single year. $70 million is gonna be invested in getting her into shape to go back down to the South Pole. There is no buddy system for her. If she runs into a problem, there is nothing with the US flag that will come to save her. So we need that, air, we need that vessel quickly. Persistence awareness and of course communications is a challenge for everyone that operates in the Arctic. The second pillar, and Tom kind of spoke to this, is the rules-based order. There's an international norm for how nations behave with each other and how they interact with one another. We need to make sure that the Arctic is no different, the way nations behave. This fly is gonna drive me crazy here. <laughs> there is a difference between a white ship, an iron ship, and a gray ship. No offense to our Navy friends, but with our legal authorities that Church kind of talked about, we can visit a vessel and inspect it based on safety, security as environmental regulators, and nobody says anything about it. Or we can be there as an element of national power wearing our Title 10 hat. And we're there to make sure that if anybody challenges the norms that are created for international activity in the maritime are violated, that we're there to say that's not the way we do it in the Arctic. And the last one is to innovate and adapt for resiliency and economic prosperity. So my first three days up in Alaska, usually what you do with your relief 
is you sit in an office and they go through files and you talk about this thing and that issue. The relief I had was, nope, we're going to the North Slope, we're getting on a snow machine, we're going offshore. We went five miles out onto the Arctic Ocean on a snow machine with Billy, who was an Arctic, he was an Alaskan whaling captain. He showed me this patch of ice, he goes, that's the Arctic equivalent of quicksand. Don't stand there, if you, we'll never see you again. Thanks, Billy, for showing me that. <laughs> and he showed me how to read the clouds. That's where the ice is melting, create special clouds, the whales are gonna be coming through there. I said, are, you know, I said, so Billy, how are things? He said, some of the things my grandfather taught me and my grandfather's grandfather taught him. Some things are new. The ice is thinner. The hunt is different. We need to adapt. And the same remains for the United States Coast Guard. We're going to adapt. And obviously, we're going to make sure that we're there. The last part we're going to do is it's very rare that our Earth gives us a clean sheet of paper for a maritime environment. The question would be, why would we use 1700s technologies of lighthouses and buoys to mark that? Let's leverage technology, virtual buoys, electronic charting. As you come through the bearing, there should be a flashing light on your chart that says, Alaska Native Activity, call this number for where the current fleet is right now. Those are the things we should be doing as we open this waterway. So we've covered a lot of ground as far as what the Coast Guard's doing and what the challenges are. Changes in the demands, the uses, and the draw of the most challenging terrain that the Coast Guard operates. But if we're gonna operate, we need to operate seven by 24. We will cooperate where we can, but we will compete if we must. And as your nation's maritime regulators, law enforcement, military, and sole military force that has the authority, the capabilities, and the capacities to do what it does, we will stand to watch just as you did in 1867. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have time for just a couple questions here, and I appreciate the, the perspectives from both the United States Air Force, United States Navy, United States Coast Guard. Uh, I have a couple questions. I see some already queuing up here, but let me get mine off first, okay, because I put some time to put these together. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna just uh, try to cue this. Um, we talked earlier, uh, through the, actually through the conference about great power competition. It was alluded through in some of the prior discussions here in this panel. Uh, well, let's take a look at great power competition at the eyes of a Russian perspective. The Russian activities in the Arctic, of course, are, are quite bolstered, and we've seen several presentations where uh, the numbers are, uh, are quite high compared to they were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, to me, from a vantage point of military service in uh, coping with the competition aspects, if competition is really what's the, the art of the game right now regarding Russian activities in the Arctic, your thoughts in managing risks and reducing threat. How, sh how concerned should we be for the current activities of Russia in the Arctic region? I'll offer the floor first to, to Leanne for your vantage point from the Air Force, and then qu quickly to the Navy and then the U.S. Coast Guard, knowing there are going to be nuances between the service perspectives. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, from the Air Force perspective, we are closely watching uh, for military advancements of on many different partners, of course, Russia's included in that. Uh, we are concerned in some areas, but we are not, I would say, concerned from a, a more global perspective. Um, while the Russians are continuing to strengthen their military presence in the region overall, to date their modernization has remained inside Russian territory, uh, with the exception of, as Maz Admiral Murata mentioned, the desire to have advanced notification which we don't think is appropriate. Uh, many Air Force assets are right on the front line of defense regarding uh, Russian air activity if there were to come an issue. And we are closely monitoring their long-range bomber activity, as you might expect, not only for homeland defense, but just to make sure there's no miscommunication. Um, Russian infrastructure deployments, training, and exercises potentially f affect our northern flank. And that's not just Air Force, but it, it can go into naval and, and other maritime security concerns as well. So we are very cautious about the Russian ability to turn civilian or defensive assets into offensive ones. And so we're right now being cautious, watching uh, that we are not you know, heightening any <laughs> significant concern. It's well, well articulated. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, Emma Murata, your, your reflections, sir. Well, the, uh, it's been mentioned here that the 
20%, 15% of the Russian GDP occurs in, that, in the Arctic region. So the Russian uh, Federation has a legitimate legal right to defend uh, their infrastructure, their assets, and their territory. And uh, nobody disputes that. Everything so far has been in, in defensive nature. We, we're watching the buildup. If it becomes concerning, if there becomes an aggressive or offensive, then th that will be met. But it, at this point, um, we are on an intelligence gathering, just watching and, and, uh, and waiting to see if, if anything uh, happens further in an offensive or aggressive manner. But right now, it seems to be uh, defensive. So it is a buildup. It is something to be concerned about. But uh, at the same time, uh, we don't want to focus on one region to the, uh, you know, and, and miss what else is going on around the world as far as the U.S. Navy. So we watch the, the Russian buildup everywhere. So uh, we have the Eastern Mediterranean, we have the North Atlantic, and we also have along the Arctic uh, approaches there. So uh, we watch it in all, in all areas. We don't see, <clears throat> like the, the yellow bullet on the slide, excuse me, <clears throat> we don't see any area of the globe. So we're watching it and, uh, and seeing where it goes. But right now, it seems to be a defensive buildup. Thank you very much, Admiral. And Admiral Abel, your reflection, sir. Well, I mean, I think Tom got it right. I mean, based on their geography and, and where there's a lot of energy, um, it makes sense that Russia has a great interest in the Arctic. I mean, just to their economic benefit. It is driving activity. When 40% uh, of the transits um, through the uh, through the bearing or LNG related, uh, most of it going to China. That's driving uh, driving activity there. Dual use. Uh, Leanne talked about. You know, is it military? Is it civilian? Kind of yes, kind of no. Yeah. Uh, and the Northern Sea Route Administration, they've kind of set up like a turnpike authority, saying we're going to charge you. Here's your gas stations. You got to use our icebreakers. It's a different kind of model that certainly doesn't jive necessarily with international norms. But I will say that in a number of forums, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum and the North Pacific uh, Coast Guard Forums, we work with our Russian counterparts, and we should. Uh, the Coast Guard works with the Border Guard. Uh, remember, the distance across the two nations is about from D.C. to Baltimore. It's 44 miles. You have got to work with your partner that's that close. If there's things in the water that shouldn't be there, oil or people, somebody has to react. You have to coordinate that. And candidly, uh, the port access route study that eventually got approved by the International Maritime Organization it was with Russian cooperation saying, this is how we can harmonize traffic with traditional uses of the water as well as environmentally sensitive areas to make sure the traffic is, uh, is well um, synchronized with other uses for the bearing. So they're great friends, but certainly they have some different interests. Well, I'm going to take, first of all, thank you for that, Admiral. Um, let me offer this is that we, of course, the other member of the great power competition equation is that of China. We had a great series of reflections. Uh, so is it a competition or a collaboration uh, or a cooperation when it comes to, to China's activities in the Arctic? From our vantage point, uh, we do know that China is expanding its operation, operational footprint in the, in the Arctic region, also investments in Arctic infrastructure. Um, I'd like to offer some reflections that you may have in China's expanding uh, roles in the Arctic. Are these uh, concerning, uh, or are they, from your vantage point, is just, is just a new era where more people are coming to take advantage of this, if you will, fourth coast for the United States? Let me first go to uh, Ms. Borman. Uh, your reflections, ma'am. Thank you. Um, we've noticed that China's Arctic narrative has been to normalize its presence in the region and that they clearly seek a governance role. But the reality is, is that <clears throat> China is not an Arctic nation. Well, Russia is, so we have a, a different approach there. But Beijing's lack of transparency, whether it's in polar research, expeditionary activities, or their approach to natural resources development is certainly of concern. Uh, DOD as a whole, and not just the Air Force, but in general, looks towards pursuing a constructive, results-oriented relationship with China, but we will not accept and this is something that we've, we've said in different ways, but I'll say it again. We will not accept policies or actions that threaten or undermine the rules-based order. Thank you very much. Uh, Admiral Murata. I, I would just echo that exactly. Um, China has every right to do research on international waters. Uh, we do the same around the world. They have every right to seek natural resources for their people. As long as it's done according to the rules that are established by international law, 
then everything will be fine. But uh, they are not an Arctic nation, so the term near Arctic, if they think that they have a role in governance, I would, dis I would disagree with that. I think, I think that uh, they ha their right to be there does not extend to the right to tell the Arctic nations that have successfully to this point uh, safeguarded this environment and are responsibly pursuing the development of it. Uh, I don't think they have, that China has a right to impede on that. The nations that live around the Arctic, um, nobody owns it really, it just, they just live around it. They have, uh, have done a pretty good job. So uh, that's where we are with China. As long as they're peaceful and follow the norms and, and international law, then they have a right to do what they want to do. Admiral, thank you. Admiral Abel? Yeah, I, I would echo the, the same for my uh, counterparts. Uh, you know, a near Arctic state means a non Arctic state. That, that's what it really means, is you're not an Arctic state. Yeah. Um, and as long as uh, you abide by the norms, um, the Chinese have an interesting pattern that they've exhibited, certainly in the Indo PACOM AOR. And if we see those types of behaviors, then I think it would be troubling as far as um, just persistent um, violation of norms that become the norm. And that's what we have to be uh, looking out for. Very much agree with that, sir. Um, thank you for the buzzer. Um, <laughs> I'd like to ask this question because obviously in your Title 14 hat, Admiral Abel, you deal with the uh, illicit activities of non-state actors from a criminal aspect in the maritime approaches in the Arctic. Uh, are your, from your vantage point, specifically since you had the experience in the United States Southern Command and the Southern Approach to the United States and the narcotic challenges presented there, from that vantage point, as you look to the Arctic, are you concerned about the list of activities from non-state actors and the U.S. maritime approaches and the Bering, Chuck Chi, and Beaufort Seas? I would say at this point, no. Um, but as you get more human activity up there, what does that human activity attract? Uh, that I don't know. But I would say that just as on our southern approach, uh, approaches the United States, it's a whole of government issue, you know, as far as working with the state, uh, work with other federal agencies that have um, Title uh, 14 or uh, Department of Justice or other agencies that could team with us uh, to make sure that the, the villages on the North Slope are just as safe as uh, any other part of our, of our nation's coastline. Thank you. Uh, my last question for you all, and I apologize for the questions, but we're getting tight on time, and I, I promise these folks I'd get through these. So I'll, hold, I'll ask you to hijack these folks after we're done here, but let me give this one last out. I appreciate that, and I'll, uh, I'm grateful for your patience. Um, so this one question for you all, because this is a community gathering where operators and scientists come together to think through tough problems and get good understandings of not only policy and governance, but also of research. So to, to make sure that I remain in good stead with the researchers in the room, uh, let me ask you respectfully, uh, what are the things, if you were, and I'll go in sequence here, what can the community of science and research do to better help your service? Uh, perhaps it's not being done now to the level you prefer, uh, be able to cope with the physical environments uh, that your services face in the Arctic. What would you want researchers to, to embark upon that they're maybe not doing or not doing enough of now? Ms. Borman, I respectfully give you the floor of the first bite of this apple. Thank you. That, that sounds like I get a blank check. That sounds wonderful. Uh, but I know that's not the case, so I'm going to uh, bring some reality to that. Uh, you know, Air Force installations are really on the front lines <clears throat> in the Arctic, and we have many challenges that all the, frankly, the research community knows quite well. Whether it's understanding permafrost distribution and construction techniques, projecting coastal erosion uh, forecasts, or uh, similar erosion that can affect our Raiders on the North Slope. We look for your advice, information, findings. Uh, we can't be every place all the time. None of our, the military services can. Uh, and where you are there, it will help us leverage more information. Uh, weather ob observing and forecasting continue to be large challenges, and the minimal surface-based sensors that we have, um, I think, is an area where we can always use additional help. Uh, but also understanding the feedback loop between sea, ice, and land will help us as we traverse over it. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Borman. Admiral Murata. Um, I would echo what Leanne said about uh, weather forecasting. Any, any way to gather more data to have more accurate and timely forecasts would help the Navy in all of our missions. 
Uh, for that matter, it would help everybody in the world because uh, most of the, in the Northern Hemisphere, Arctic weather drives what's going on in, in the continental region. So if we could have that. Um, the other thing is only about 4% of the Arctic Ocean is actually uh, charted as far as depths and salinities, salinities and those types of things. So if we could have uh, more research done on the actual uh, charting of the area as the ice recedes, make that a priority to make sure that all of our charts are accurate for all this, you know, that'll make Dan's uh, job easier because the more accurate our charts, the less people are likely to run aground. Um, also prevent environmental mishaps too, as well as search and rescue for our Coast Guard. So those two things, uh, data, ga uh, ways to gather data, whether it's uh, a new higher technology buoys that, uh, that have longer battery life, uh, those types of things, or, or maybe uh, ice penetrating, if we can measure bathymetry in a different way than we've done it for a thousand years, that would be a, a great technology to have. Admiral, thank you. Admiral Abel? Um, absolutely. Uh, I echo what these folks said. You know, you said 4% is charted. The other way to look at that is 96% is not. <laughs> if, if you took off in an airplane and the pilot said, I know where 4% of the mountains are, let's go get them. <laughs> that would be bad. probably be a little leery That'd be bad. It was not taking good. that. Uh, and some of these soundings go back to Captain Cook days. Uh, so absolutely, we need contemporary sounding. The other thing that would be is any sort of trending to help us figure out where this region is going. When things happen twice as fast as forecast or the, the, the ice-free season is increasing 10 times faster than we thought. Um, and, and I know that it's real tough for scientists to extrapolate forward, but if you let us know where things are going, then we can help as far as the presence we need, the activity we can expect, and to make sure that we stay one step ahead of what the world and the nation needs in this fragile part of the world. Admiral, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, from my vantage point, the nation is well served by senior leaders such as these three folks in representing the respective services in securing America's national interests in the Arctic region. Please join me in a, round, a warm round of applause for these patriots. So it's my distinct privilege and honor to welcome to this, uh, this Arctic or slash Alaska operations panel. And again, my forbearance is much, or your forbearance is much appreciated for those folks who wish to ask questions. We had mentioned earlier the desire to just scamper through questions we kind of help these folks prepare for, but to give them a chance to offer some candid reflections on those. And just in the interest of time where we're at in this calendar, we thought it'd be better to go, best to keep on this approach. Uh, at this point, this panel is a uh, panel is planned to give a perspective if you will, in the coastal regions and the land regions, uh, land and airspace regions. Uh, and from a vantage point, the Coast Guard District 17 conducts, of course, across the, the entire state of Alaska to include the Arctic region as defined by the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and legislation in 1984, the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas. But uh, Admiral Matt Bell is the district commander, uh, if you will, commands a district that is staggering and frankly uh, is a mismatch of resources from, uh, to areas of responsibility. And uh, frankly, his team is a small team, but is powerful because of what they do. They're, they've become icons in, uh, in American media. Uh, Coast Guard Alaska is certainly well, well understood, and probably more people learn about Alaska and the Coast Guard Arctic mission uh, simply by watching, and their mission, Ross Barley, Alaska, but just by watching TV and getting a little bit of the flavor that's mostly done from Kodiak and other stations, the U.S. Coast Guard mans across the state. Admiral Bell, of course, has great experience uh, as not only the district commander, but prior operational experience uh, in at subordinate levels within the district. He's also someone that plans to stay in Alaska <laughs> someday in the future when the Coast Guard him find a way to, when the Coast Guard finally retires him, he'll remain in the state and you know, he'll go to the state if he goes back out. Bottom line, he will be somewhere in Kodiak looking after and making sure the Coast Guard stays on watch there in that region, uh, unless the Coast Guard drags him someplace else and keeps him there for too long. Uh, General Streff, of course, represents uh, prior to the Alaska Army National Guard, now Assistant Adjutant General for the State and Director of the Joint Staff. And General Streff, of course, is a, represents uh, as Coast Guard, uh, Admiral Bell co represents Coast Guard in Alaskan operations. General Streff is uh, as actually representing the National Guard in the state of Alaska. And the Alaska National Guard, of course, is one of 54 uh, National Guards across the United States, which includes states and territories. And as uh, both uh, 
the uh, Coast Guard's in the business of a hand of help and a clenched fist resolved in the coastal regions. Uh, General Streff has principally supported his uh, combat operations when called by the nation, uh, but then also to provide that hand of help for disaster response or civil assistance within the state. And uh, they meet at the water lines, if you will, and, uh, but ultimately they sub mutually support each other in the context of providing that hand of help across the state for not only search and rescue, but also uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster response. So I could think of no better pairing of two champions who understand Alaska at the tactical level than having Rear Admiral Matt Bell and Brigadier General Joe Streff from Coast Guard District 17 and the Alaska National Guard. I'd like to start with uh, the presentations as we did in the last panel as a brief discussion by both Admiral Bell and General Streff, followed by some questions and answers uh, in the fireside chat approach that I've uh, queued up with as previously mentioned. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral Matt Bell, and I'll be your slide person as you desire. Great, great, thanks Church. And uh, so next, next slide if you would. So, so the Coast Guard uh, executes Arctic operations in, in accordance with national and uh, Coast Guard Arctic strategic policy. Uh, from my perspective, you're going to hear a simple sailor's review of what goes on in the Arctic on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got about 2,500 Coasties that work from southeast through south central, western Alaska to the northern part of the, the state. We provide a mobile and scalable presence in that Arctic domain, and I kind of classify that as we meet those operations in the Arctic via an expeditionary type nature, meaning we take the assets and the people and move them to the locations needed or described by the activity that's there. That planning, the support, and the operations occur throughout the year. And that increase in op tempo when we get past those shoulder season and the ice kind of recedes, that's when that activity increases and our presence shows. Uh, next slide, if you would. And so we talk about this, this activity, and uh, the Coast Guard in response to that both performs a response mission, search and rescue is pretty, is, is pretty prevalent, most folks know about that. We also have a pollution response aspect that, that started back as the tragedy unfolded there in 1989. And then we have prevention missions such as vessel and facility inspections, and uh, the Coast Guard does throughout the state, but it's representative of those missions that are in the lower 48. Residents and waterways users throughout Alaska deserve those same type of services and same type of support that we would see anywhere else in the country. That activity is increasing. Uh, you've seen much talk over that the last couple of days, whether that's increase in tourism, ecotourism, extreme tourism, tourist ships walking across the top of the country, as well as increased cargo traffic, vessel traffic, commercial tankers, uh, daily traffic up and down the western seaboard of Alaska and across the top. We've also got continual research activity from Bering Straits off to the northeast and off to the northwest. And then, of course, community subsistence, uh, both hunting and fishing in those regions. Uh, we've talked about uh, how that environment is changing. And most of the, uh, the, the native Alaskan hunters and fishers will tell you that where they used to be a few years ago, just five, 10 miles offshore, now they're having to transit as far as 50, 60, 70 miles to achieve those same hunting goals. In response to these activities, that drives the Coast Guard act activities, if you will, operations elsewhere. So next slide. So in an ideal world, the Coast Guard would be positioned from southeast, my hometown, Juneau currently, from, uh, I'll call it the gateway in the Arctic, Kodiak Island, through the Aleutian chain, up through the Bering Sea, Bering Straits, into the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. Uh, we, ca we capped that off with uh, Healy's annual transit uh, north in support of the National Science Foundation. We try to position a, a, deck, a flight deck equipped cutter in the Bering Straits to do Arctic operations two to four months out of the year. We have a forward operating uh, air base that we deploy out of Kotzebue where we'll fly H-60s. Uh, down in the Bering Sea, we have a continual presence year-round of a flight deck equipped cutter, mostly provides search and rescue and law enforcement actions in the Bering Sea. All of those come either home station in Kodiak or somewhere in the lower 48. Now, let me say that again. All of those assets I just described come from Kodiak or the lower 48. So if you look at the entire western region of Alaska and the northern part of the state, there are no embed, no home ported assets in that particular part of the region. We drive those resources from Kodiak or the lower 48 as activity increases. Again, mobile force packages, mobile capability, 
expeditionary in fashion. That ideal force laydown allows me to kind of talk through what we would expect uh, from a daily operational perspective. So if you'd go to the next slide. So in addition to the on-water capabilities, on-water requirements that we typically associate with law, law enforcement, search and rescue, we also have an obligation to take a look at uh, prevention and response capabilities ashore. Sector Anchorage uh, runs uh, a, a mission every, uh, every year to look at 394 bulk storage facilities throughout Alaska. 360 of them are not accessible via road, and 275 of those bulk facilities reside in the Arctic. The facilities are inaccessible, requires us to go by air, by a snow machine, and even by dog sled team. In order to attain mission readiness and then increase our awareness, as well as accurately prioritize the risks with those facilities, Sector Anchorage has developed a plan to get out and reach those particular facilities over the next three to five years. Why three to five years? Well, to put that into perspective, to, to uh, visit a shoreside facility in the lower 48, an inspector would go out and it's about a one to two hour evolution. For those in Alaska, it takes two to three days just to get there. Same inspection and then two to three days to return home. So over the next two to three years, we'll be able to establish, I'll call it a baseline, review of those particular facilities. This illustration in the center of the picture there shows uh, Sector Anchorage's approach to get out to 12 of those, I'll call them designated hub locations, and then two to three weeks by a very capable, uh, trained and tried uh, uh, team, we'll be able to get out to those smaller individual communities surrounding that particular hub. Again, two to three weeks out in the field, they can come back, reprovision, and then redeploy to the next hub community. Next slide, if you will. So when we talk about the activity in the Arctic, this picture shows or demonstrates just one day from this past fall on who's operating in the Arctic. We talk about vessel activity is increasing, whether that's cruise ships, tug and barges, research vessels, cargo vessels, tankers, adventurers, commercial, and even subsistence vessels from all those coastal communities. The traffic level remains modest. We project that's going to continue to increase as we see that ice recede over time. Uh, I'd like to put this in perspective. When you just look at that distance that all of those are, are covered in that particular graphic, if you go to the next slide. So just this past fall, we had a, a particular day, I'll call it two days, uh, one tragic loss and the other a very great success story. So Cutter uh, Munro is uh, down doing fisheries patrols off of the off of Slime Bank down next to the Aleutian Chain when District 17 Command Center got a call for a potential man overboard from the fishing vessel Clipper Epic. Uh, 400 and nautical miles northwest of where Douglas Munro was positioned was, uh, got underway and proceeded at best speed to get to that location. So when you consider 25 knot winds, uh, 10 foot seas and nearly zero visibility. It took the ship almost 20 hours to arrive on scene. With the support of uh, C-130 support coming out of Kodiak, they were able to do uh, a search and rescue process or exercise in, in searching for a man overboard in some pretty austere conditions. Unfortunately, we were unable to locate the member that fell overboard. Seven hours later, we got a second call through the command center uh, from uh, Tuninac that talked about a, uh, a skiff that had gotten underway and then ended up displaced from the beach with five people on board, three adults and two children. So again, Monroe was asked to respond in addition to some H-60s out of Kodiak and the additional C-130 support. Again, battling 30 knot winds, 11 foot seas and less than two miles of visibility arrived on scene 14 hours later. In this case, success, the H-60 that came out of Kodiak, refueled in Bethel, arrived on scene, was actually able to execute the hoist, and all five personnel were recovered. I, I highlight this case because when you talk about the tyranny of distance, so some 1,400 miles covered by the cutter, almost 4,500 nautical miles covered by the C-130s, and the H-60s just to prosecute those two SAR cases 
within about a 48 hour time span. So now translate that search and rescue case to the Arctic Ocean. Translate that to north of Utkiavik and, and ask yourself how long will it take those Coast Guard resources to respond? As you heard Admiral Abel just a moment ago, we would like to be in a position to do that response 24 seven, 365. Currently today, I do not have that capability. We'll be lucky for the next couple of months that Healy will be up doing work for the, for the National Science Foundation. And beyond that, it's rotary wing uh, uh, search and rescue, deploying from Kodiak, walking itself up the west coast of Alaska to the North Slope. Takes eight to 10 hours for those helicopters to arrive uh, in Utkiavik, and by then we'd need to change out the air crew for another crew to be able to fly that mission. This highlights those challenges. Next slide, if you will. And, I, and I'd like to summarize those Arctic operations challenges day to day. The limited infrastructure that's there, the minimal communications, the tyranny of distance requires us to go a long way beyond that, uh, that supporting home base. The sparse resources that exist when you get there, you're gonna use up those precious resources that you have very, very quickly. We can talk about extreme or unpredictable weather. And the, and the operators that work there, I, I call most Coast Guard men and women good at what they do. When they come to Alaska, they become great at what they do because they are challenged by the environment. They're challenged by that tyranny of distance. We can talk about the investments that we need to make in the future to kind of counteract or mitigate those challenges. And those, I've kind of grouped them into four buckets. Invest in the infrastructure, invest in the people, invest in our capabilities, and invest in the partnerships. Our partnerships are crucial and key across the state. I can tell you there's no one entity, whether that's on the federal level, at the state level, or at the private level, that has the resources needed to do what they can do across the state. We all rely on each other to get those missions done. And, and, and as you can see, the partnership that we have here at the table exemplifies the partnerships that we have around the state. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Church and uh, introduce Joe here, please. Admiral Bell, thank you very, very much. <clears throat> Gerald Streff, uh, first of all, let me get your slides queued up here. Mr. Slide, man in the back. Well, Church, I want to say thanks uh, for the invitation. And thank uh, you. as your token Army guy, I'll uh, uh, do my best to uh, uh, merge the, the, the Marine piece of this into uh, the land and air uh, domains that uh, are usually my, uh, my responsibility. You'll be exceptional without question. <laughs> Sir, you got the floor. Great, thanks. Um, we've seen a lot of maps. Uh, but I'd like to take uh, a moment and just have you imagine something. <clears throat> Ketchikan, Alaska would sit in South Carolina. The North Slope of Alaska would sit in northern Minnesota. The southeast part, or I'm sorry, south central part of Alaska would sit in the vicinity of Arkansas and Oklahoma. The end of the Aleutians would sit in Southern California. So when you talk about the land domain and the air domain, uh, that's the uh, depth and uh, breadth of what we're looking at. And that's what the National Guard, both air and army, operate in as a, uh, on a regular basis. Admiral Bill mentioned the tyranny of distance, <clears throat> but that's not the only challenge. Uh, we have weather, terrain, uh, human endurance, and logistical problems, and that's just part of our daily mission set. Um, next slide. I work for the Department of uh, Military and Veterans Affairs. That's the umbrella organization that the National Guard falls underneath. My boss is called an adjutant general. I'm an assistant adjutant general. And um, we are a, a federally funded uh, organization which reports to the governor, unlike uh, the uh, regular forces which report to the president. Uh, what you see there is our mission statement for uh, the DMVA. Um, we are changing some of our, uh, uh, our mission statements based on uh, the Department of Defense. They published an Arctic strategy last month. And um, one of the couple of things I'd like to mention is that uh, uh, we have a federal responsibility as a, as a National Guard, but the National Guard in Alaska conducts federal missions, homeland defense missions, uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. We also have a state responsibility. Uh, Church mentioned that uh, uh, we have a, a domestic or a domestic response res uh, responsibilities uh, that includes uh, 
uh, a number of things that uh, impact the citizenry of Alaska, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we also have um, uh, domain awareness in our search and rescue responsibility and environmental protection missions. The Alaska National Guard uh, has the responsibility to lead the Alaska Native Tribal Liaison supporting engagement with local indigenous communities. And we also have uh, the opportunity to conduct international engagement with Arctic allies and partners. And there's another thing that uh, we have that's called the Arctic Interest Council, which was put together by uh, my uh, uh, previous boss. And the Arctic Interest Council has uh, uh, associated with uh, the northern tier states of the National Guard, where we collaborate on uh, solving some of the problems that exist in a uh, uh, environment where we haven't operated as a military for a while. And what I mean by that is, for the past 20 years, we've been at war in, in effectively a desert. And we lost some of our uh, skill sets relative to uh, operating in a cold weather environment. Next slide. So the Alaska, Alaska National Guard was started as the uh, uh, Territorial Guard in 1942. It consisted of uh, 5,600 mostly native uh, members in, one in 107 communities around Alaska. Uh, the, they were volunteers. They ranged in age from 12 to 80 and were minimally equipped. Their objectives back between 1942 and 1945 was uh, domain awareness and uh, their ability to be the eyes and the ears for the Army as uh, we didn't have the surveillance that we have today. After World War II, the Alaska Territorial Guard transitioned to the Alaska uh, Army National Guard and took over uh, the same mission, uh, being the eyes and the ears uh, for what would be a Soviet uh, incursion in, uh, in and around our, on our shores and our air. Uh, that mission changed again in uh, 1991 uh, when the collapse of the Soviet Union took place. Um, the uh, uh, we then took on a, a um, more aggressive deployment schedule as required, and that had impacts into our membership in, in rural Alaska. <clears throat> Realized that uh, uh, there's a subsistence lifestyle in rural Alaska, and when we ask our soldiers to deploy for uh, a year, 15 months, they will uh, miss a year of taking care of their families. So that includes not only uh, maybe their wife and kids, but their mother and father, and possibly their, their grandparents also. So the major units that we have are uh, infantry, aviation, and then we, uh, we talked about the ground, or we talked about the uh, uh, Title 10 piece of things. That's our ground-based mid-course missile defense system, which is up at Fort Greeley, Alaska. <clears throat> That's chartered with uh, intercepting any uh, inbound missiles that might be uh, uh, threatening the homeland. We, uh, we call it the 300 that defend 300 million. So between the Alaska Army National Guard and the Colorado Guard, uh, that's, uh, that's our, one of our key Title X missions. All right, next slide. The Alaska Air National Guard was created in, 82, or in 1952 uh, and uh, was, it was a training unit. It's now one of the uh, most active Air National Guard units in the country. Uh, multiple missions, uh, air transport, rescue coordination, air refueling, and air defense. We uh, also have a space surveillance and early warning system that uh, is designed to uh, identify intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles. The Coast Guard is amazingly busy in Alaska with rescues. Admiral Bell described just uh, a couple of those. The uh, Air National Guard works very closely with the Coast Guard and the Army Guard to uh, uh, rescue some of the uh, uh, unfortunate things that do develop in Alaska. But the busiest rescue unit in the United States for the Air Guard is the Alaska Air National Guard. Since 1990, there's been 1,960 missions, 1,694 saves. And you gotta remember, this isn't just going out and picking them up. As Admiral Bell described, you know, this, is, this is just in the most brutal environments, uh, in, uh, in, in the most difficult terrain. People typically don't crash their planes um, you know, on a, uh, next to our runway, though that happens. Uh, the uh, um, bottom line is that uh, 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 between, the three, between the three forces, we'll, uh, we'll respond to the call. Next slide. We have a 
organization called the Alaska State Defense Force. It's a volunteer organization. It's nice for people in Alaska, uh, if they want to continue their service having uh, been in the military, or if you are a, a non-prior service individual, you can still serve uh, without going through uh, the, the rigors of uh, basic training or uh, uh, the equivalent in the Air Force. They support emergency response and operations in Alaska, <clears throat> and they uh, uh, have a, a presence in, uh, I think, 14 different communities. Okay, next slide. So I'm the director of the joint staff, and there's a lot of things that uh, uh, we do. We knit together uh, the operations between uh, the Army and the Air, the active duty and the reserves, and the, uh, uh, my responsibility is the Arctic strategy. And the along with the uh, uh, NORTHCOM and the uh, Arctic Interest Council, we're, we're forming what uh, will be uh, the, the way ahead for, for operations in uh, not only the Arctic, but a cold weather environment. One of the things I'd like to highlight is the, uh, uh, the opportunity to cooperate between uh, the Department of Defense and our uh, um, local communities. It's called the Innovative Readiness Training Program. <clears throat> we have uh, a number of, of uh, projects that we've uh, executed over uh, 20 some years in Alaska. The Innovative Readiness Training Program brings together uh, military units who need to conduct training in their specific jobs with communities that have requirements that match. So I would, uh, Highlight a couple of those with uh, the road building in Metlakatla, for those of you that know where that's at, uh, where they put in about 10 miles of road and it took them about seven years to do it because they did a, uh, they had to cut literally into the side of a mountain so that uh, they could uh, uh, create a, a dock facility. And uh, we're in the process of uh, moving a village. Uh, there's a village called Newtok that's out in uh, uh, southwestern Alaska. And we're uh, helping them uh, relocate to uh, the village is uh, suffering from erosion pretty significantly. We're moving it across and on top of a hill uh, to a place called McTarvick. There's also another operation that we've conducted uh, with uh, uh, a number of different uh, units across, uh, uh, across the United States, and it's called Arctic Care. We take medical professionals, we take them out into uh, rural Alaska and provide medical care as, uh, as, they've, uh, re as the Native communities have requested. We also have a, uh, back one. We, we also do a lot of exercises, <clears throat> which um, uh, are uh, joint, multi-component, uh, and it's, it's a very, very active. As a, as, as a side, we also have a partnership program with Mongolia. It's called State Partnership Program. And what we do is uh, uh, cooperate mill to mill, uh, university to university, uh, emergency management to emergency management, uh, uh, from uh, uh, because our, our match with Mongolia is very, very similar in terms of climate, in terms of economic, in terms of rural uh, issues. Okay, thanks. The military supports our civil authorities when the civil authorities call us. We're not first responders. What we do is respond when asked. So, for example, uh, when we conduct an aviation response, uh, 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 search and rescue, it's not that somebody calls the Air Force or somebody calls the RCC. Somebody calls typically the troopers, and the troopers then call the RCC, and the Rescue Coordination Center adjudicates who gets what as far as the response goes. There's, there's two Rescue Coordination Centers in Alaska. One is in uh, Juneau, and the other one is in... Uh, uh, Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, and there's a constant dialogue that goes on between those two facilities. And um, we we work together with those uh, uh, with the civil authorities and the Homeland Security and uh, uh, Emergency Management section of the uh, DMVA is our civil response to things like mm, earthquakes, <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so next slide. I'd like to just. Orient you to a couple different pictures here. Uh, on the bottom left is a uh, 
uh, F-22 intercept and of a bear bomber. That is a, that is a reserve unit. Uh, that reserve unit is uh, being refueled by, if you take a look at the top left picture, uh, an Air Guard National, an Air National Guard uh, KC-135 that's out of Fairbanks. So the bottom plane is out of Air Anchorage. The top plane is out of uh, uh, Fairbanks. The, the guy that's on the scope is National Guardsman, but this is all coordinated uh, at, the, at the Title 10 level with uh, the uh, uh, NORAD, NORTHCOM, uh, coordination, and that's General Boussier in, uh, in in Alaska Command. On the bottom right hand, on the bottom right hand side is uh, a missile being loaded into a, a missile silo at Fort Greeley, and that's where our Title 10 uh, uh, National Guardsmen stand watch 24/7, 365. And on the top right is uh, uh, you can see three helicopters. Uh, two of them are Air Guard. One is Army Guard, and that's part of the uh, ISEX program. Um, and we, uh, we did support uh, historically for the ISEX program. Next slide. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what you're looking at is um, uh, some, of the, some of the things that can go wrong in Alaska. Top left, Senator Murkowski mentioned there were 24,000 lightning strikes. Um, typically, you know, we, uh, of, of the hundreds of fires that do burn in Alaska, we only respond when, uh, uh, when they run out of uh, uh, civil support for those kind of things. And typically the civil support and the Alaska National Guard only fight fires where there is a uh, threat to uh, infrastructure. Otherwise we just let fires burn um, until the snow flies. On the uh, right hand side is um, uh, a uh, <coughs> package that is, it, it's a um, Arctic survival package. It's a, an air mobile or air droppable ground mobile uh, package that can be deployed to drop uh, into a, uh, an isolated area to assist 28 people for six and a half days. Um, it's uh, uh, something that was funded through the, uh, through the National Guard and <clears throat> that's, that's one of the areas that uh, we would like to expand upon as a, as, a, as a rescue <clears throat> method. Because again, as the uh, uh, previous panel mentioned, it, it takes forever to get across Alaska, 48 hours to get to that, get to that boat, 17 hours to get to uh, um, another, uh, another uh, emergency. And when, uh, when we look at uh, the things that go, go on in Alaska, there's just a lot of gaps, a lot of capability gaps. Bottom left was November 30th. That was uh, the 7.1 earthquake, one of the one of the roads that was damaged. And on the right-hand side there is um, where the epicenter was and the aftershocks. We had about 10,000 aftershocks. Uh, last count was, I think, May is that when I heard 10,000. So those are the kind of things that we are dealing with uh, um, as, a, uh, as an Alaska guard. Thanks. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the commission officers of the United States military are always advised from the day they strap on their commission, they serve at the pleasure of the commander in chief. Today, the discussions uh, that we've been able, been honored to present, were served at the, at the pleasure of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. So based on some interest uh, of moving to the next conversation, uh, we're going to bring this conversation to close. But before we do so, could you please offer a round warm applause for these champions? Well done, and thank you very, very much.